Okay, well, terrific. Uh, today on That's Classic, it's another interesting one. Uh, today we have um, a woman who happens to be the uh, manager of the estate of Jerry Herman and uh, was also very, very close because she was also his goddaughter. Just for my audience, Jerry Herman is probably the maybe the most prolific theatrical composer lyricist of the century. Uh, he he worked on uh, Hello Dolly, Mame, La Cage Au Fa. He uh, uh, worked with Carol Channing, Angela Lansbury, Leslie Uggams, Bernadette Peters, Tyne Daly, Kristen Chenoweth, and it goes on and on and on. And uh, plus, there's also an upcoming memorabilia state auction that's going to be coming up as well. So anyway, I'd like to welcome Jane Dorian. Welcome, Jane. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, well, I, I'm thrilled to have you. So let's get right into Jerry. Um, you know, I, as I said, you you are his goddaughter and you were there literally. I, saw, I remember seeing a photo. You were there like you're just a tiny, tiny kid, you know, um, on the piano. Well, there never was a time when Jerry wasn't in my life. And except for that sad day when he passed away in uh, 2019. So by way of, of explanation of how I became his goddaughter, Jerry and my mother, met the first day of class at the University of Miami. And they were the two skinniest kids on campus. They circled one another and never said a word. But as fate would have it, that night, they were at the same freshman party. Jerry was at the piano playing the American Songbook. My mother sat down next to him and started singing because she was a trained operatic singer. And the two of them made music together until the day she died. Wow. And it was one of the most legendary friendships imaginable. They laughed, they uh, saw theater together. They were just inseparable. And it was sort of like this crazy psychic connection because they could be walking down the street, not saying a word, and they would start singing the same song in the same key. Wow. I mean, like, how, how, does, how does that happen? So yeah. when I was born, um, of course, I was named Jane after Jerry. And Jerry was really like my father. There literally wasn't a day when Jerry wasn't a huge part of my life. Wow, that's amazing. You know, you know, one thing that I, I saw about Jerry that just blows me away is, I mean, it, it, it it's a classic story because, you know, we always think of like, you know, you have to go to the best schools, you have to go to this, you know, and you'll be the best, whatever. And in Jerry's case, he gets turned down by Juilliard three times. And am yes. I correct on this? He couldn't read music. He could not read or write music, but he had an <laughs> ear. He played like a 20 piece orchestra. And um, the story goes, his mother was getting dressed one day and she calls downstairs and says, Jerry, who's there? And he goes, no one, mom. And she goes, cut it out, who's there? And she found him playing the battle hymn of the Republic with two hands at an incredibly early age. He just had this gift. He could hear something and he could play it. So as a matter of fact, I think I showed him where C was on a piano. So he would write a song the lyrics would get typewritten and he would have to play into a tape recorder and then someone would transpose it for him. And you know who else was like this? Oh. Irving Berlin. Oh my gosh, come on. I mean, you know, like, I mean, that's so inspiring because, you know, there's so many, you know, even now there's so many young kids out there that are trying to get into these colleges and, you know, it's like life or death. And if I don't get into Berkeley School of Music or if I don't get into whatever, it's the end of my, you know, my, my dream. And I mean, I hate to say it on a certain level, I mean, this is the best way, but what a joke when, you know, you have literally these icons of, of the industry, you know, you say Irving Berlin and Jerry Herman, and they, 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 they couldn't, you know, couldn't read music, you got turned up, but I mean, that's just crazy to me. But what, I think you're raising such an important point. So yes, if you're a, a brain surgeon, of course, we want you to go to the best schools. I sure. mean, it goes without saying. But I think one of the things that made Jerry so great was he had the opportunity to practice his craft at an incredibly early age. His parents had a summer camp in upstate New York, and he was the musical director. Wow. So he literally, you know, at, at his mother's, you know, apron strings, learned how to direct and play parts for people and light. And if you ask any one of the celebrities that worked with him, they always felt so comfortable with him because he could look on a stage and say, no, 
let's change that blue gel to an amber gel because you'll look better. Or he, he just, he, there wasn't any aspect of the theater except probably choreography that he, that he couldn't do. And I thought that was great. You know, so often people think, oh, I'll just go on a computer and write something. No, you've got to practice. You've got to fall flat on your face. He did nightclub acts and he did um, off off Broadway reviews. He just had the opportunity to work, 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 work. So it seems like he was an overnight sensation, but really he had been doing this his entire life. Wow, that's just that's just really incredible. You know, now as I said earlier, you were there for a, you know many important moments in his life. Were you, you know, and because you know obviously you're you're not as old as a lot of these these women were at the time or whatever. But were you around with um, any of the the people that I mentioned? You know, like Carol Channing or Angela well, Lansbury. Of course or, I was. You know. Of course I was. So let's start with when I was a very small child. Carol Channing and Charles Nelson Riley would come over to my parents' home, obviously with Jerry. Charles Nelson team. Riley was hilarious. He loved to do magic tricks and he made Hershey bars fall from the ceiling, or at least so I thought. Wow. Um, I actually performed with Carol Channing. I was in Hello Dolly for three years on a national touring company with her, which was an absolute blast. Oh my gosh. You know, the thing about these performers that we're talking about, they were the consummate pros. They did it all and they were so good at what they did yeah was carol what was carol you know obviously you spent three years on, on the tour what was she like you know I, I mean she's an interesting one out of out of any of them that i mentioned i can see her in that huge hat i can see the whole hello dolly vibe all of that but when the cameras aren't on she's back in her dressing room and you're just talking to her what was she like well the first thing that you might not know is she was incredibly smart hmm. You know, everyone thinks she's a ditzy blonde, Lorelai. And I think being a, a fine comedic actress takes more intelligence than you could possibly imagine. She could read an audience like nobody's business. You know, some nights are the scene at the Harmonia Gardens when she's eating those dumplings. Sometimes she would do 12. Sometimes she would do 26. And she always knew, she knew how to squeeze that last laugh, but she was incredibly smart and she was a brilliant marketer. And that's right. something that a lot of our talent doesn't do today. They rely on social media. Any group, any individual could come to the theater either before the show or after the show and she would talk to them. Hmm. What happened was everybody across the country felt that they knew her. So when she would come back, you know, every few years to these towns, everybody wanted to go back and see Hello Dolly and they wanted to see Carol because she made them feel like they were her friend or she was their friend. And, yeah. I, and I just love that. And that kind of segues into something that I think is hugely important. Um, that generation was a generation of teaching and giving back. And so we're having a huge um, auction for... Mm -hmm. um, through uh, Doyle, or it's really to benefit ASCAP, Jerry has left a foundation, the Jerry Herman a Legacy Foundation through ASCAP. Where... Hey, explain what ASCAP is, because my audience won't necessarily just know that. All right. So ASCAP is the American Society of Songwriters, whatever. So basically, mm -hmm. every single time a song is played, like in a restaurant or in, a, um, uh, in an elevator or something... Sure they make sure that the uh that the songwriters get you know their their residuals so to speak or, or, right. or compensation or whatever and they also help to protect their music as well it's a very important organization mm -hmm. very um, and it's not just for broadway composers and lyricists it's for all musicians they also have tremendous outreach. They they help train lyricists and their outreach is fantastic. But for Jerry, it was incredibly important that a foundation be set up so that he could take his program that he developed with ASCAP to teach young students, whether it's the high school or preferably the college level, and offer scholarships for those kids who, you know, go through the program and also demonstrate, you know, some real talent yeah, and yeah. 
and ASCAP will continue that for many, many decades to come. And hopefully we might find one more Jerry Herman or one more Irving yeah. Berlin or, or Cy Colin or whatever. And um, I think that's really a beautiful legacy to leave for all young people. So if if someone you know were to either online or they happen to actually get the opportunity to go to the auction, will those proceeds in essence go to that? A hundred percent. That's what it's all there for. So Jerry was very clear. He wanted his memorabilia auctioned off and those proceeds were to go to the ASCAP Foundation. Yeah. And then we've got another interesting auction. Yeah. So I don't know if you know about Jerry's unused crypt. Yes, I, I do. In fact, I, I have plenty of questions for you, but go well, ahead. Why don't you ask, okay, I'll tell you okay. about it. I can't wait for the questions. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so in Los Angeles, in Westwood, there is a very famous cemetery called Pierce Brothers Memorial, Westwood Memorial uh, Cemetery. And it's where the biggest stars are interned. So you've got Marilyn Monroe, you've got Billy Wilder, you've got Truman Capote, uh, Farrah Fawcett, the list just goes on Don and on. Knotts, Jack Lemmon. I mean, uh, I could, I could can, reel exactly. them off too. It's incredible. We don't have enough time. I, if yeah. I read the whole list, our, our, our True. time. And it's tiny. It's this tiny little cemetery. But it's tiny. It's elegant. It's tucked mm -hmm. away. And Jerry always romanticized, you know, the great Hollywood stars and so back in the 90s, when he was living in California, he had some health issues and he knew it was time to start getting his, his affairs in order. So Jerry loved real estate. I think he owned and redid about 75 properties Gosh, through, through, throughout his lifetime because he also attended Parsons School of Design. So he huh. was- like, I mean, like he had time. That's what's amazing to me. Well, what's, what's <laughs> even more amazing to me is, and I'm quoting Carol Channing on this one, but she would say when he stood in line in front of God for talent, he just kept on going back. He didn't know you were only supposed to stand in line once. So, oh. he, I mean, I mean, his talents were just, it just went on and on and on. But anyway, yeah. um, so he understood the value of real estate, but more than anything, I think that he wanted to be with all of that great talent for the great beyond. In the 11th hour, he decided he wanted to be buried next to his two best girls, his mother and my mother back East. And that is where Jerry is interned. And it's funny towards the end of your life, when you, when you have that, that moment, yeah. that he wanted to do. So we have this unused crypt. Now a crypt is a crypt, of course, but Jerry's crypt mates are pretty remarkable. Hugh Hefner and Marilyn Monroe. Yeah. So if anybody wants to be able to spend eternity next to arguably the two sexiest people that yeah. ever lived and yep. probably the two best marketers that ever lived. Oh, without a doubt. This is your opportunity. Now I learned something fascinating. Sure. In this crypt, it can either be one body or it could be uh, four cremated urns. That is interesting. I didn't. I didn't know that they did that. I listen. You. You. You know, life has a way of educating you. So <laughs> right. Here, here. Here we are. But it is a remarkable opportunity. And that is being auctioned on November 23rd through Studio Auctions. And I believe that website goes up today. So if you want to have um, your opportunity for eternity next to two of the sexiest people ever, here is your chance. You know, I uh, I had heard, and I, I don't know the gentleman, but I had heard that the, uh, the crypt that is directly, I think it's directly above Marilyn Monroe, I think this was a few years back, a, a gentleman bought it. And I swear, I'm pretty sure on this, it was like he ended up spending like $2 million to get it. No, 4.6 oh, 4.6. Okay, there you go. I knew it was and huge. It, yeah. it was 20 years ago, but um, this yeah, is- Yeah, 20 long. years ago was 4.6. Right. So this oh. is a little naughty, but he wanted to be placed face down right. over- so right. you, you understand. Yeah. So, yeah. so anyway, yes, this-, this um, this cemetery is just, it, it reads like the who's who. And the best part of all is if you are interned there, I promise you, your friends, your family, your grandchildren, your great grandchildren, they will come visit on a regular basis because it's like, you know, a walk down memory lane. 
it is it is it's probably one of the most unique cemeteries i've ever seen and 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 the the amount of people that are there and and the uh it's just it's just it, it really is an incredible thing well that's cool and will those proceeds also go uh towards you know charity or however no you it, those th that's more of, of a of, of an estate kind of a situation okay. so it's, it's a little you. bit more it's a little more uh, a little bit more uh complicated than that but that said yeah. They're both amazing opportunities, and you can have a little piece of Jerry one for either auction. So that's it's very cool, very cool. So let's go back just real quick to Carol. So Carol had that voice, you know. I was like, I I can't even like do it. But when she was off, and you're that was sitting her there, voice. oh come on, really? That was her voice. Wow. I mean, go back to Lorelai. I mean, you yeah. can see, I mean, gentlemen prefer blondes. That was it. Um, the only time I ever heard her do something slightly different was her nightclub act. She does the, she did the funniest routine about Cecilia, somebody who had a, a lisp. And so she whistled every single time she spoke. So she was able to, to train her voice to do something different, but that was Carol. And she was, she was wonderful. The theater was her life. The theater was her family. And she was an original. I don't think she ever missed a performance. Wow. That's amazing. That is, was she, you know, like I said, though, you, you know, cameras are off. Nobody's in there. She's not trying to market herself, whatever. She's just her. What kind of person was she? Was she more of a, you know, introvert at that time? Was she, what was she like? No, I think she was pretty much, you know, kind of what I mean, not bigger than life, but she was she was always intellectually curious. She always wanted to know what was going on. She cared. She cared deeply about people. And um I'll tell you one funny story. Sure. She once went to the beauty parlor and they left the bleach on her hair too long. So it burned her hair off. Mm. And it caused a very odd chemical reaction in her system. So she wound up with a lot of food allergies. So we were performing in Portland. So she was known for bringing her own food with her wherever she went. It had to be basically boiled. She had to drink distilled water because there were just so many things that could really upset her system. So we were in um, in Portland and she really wanted some fish. And I said, I'm going to go to the fish market. And I said, and I will find you a piece of fish that isn't brined and you'll be fine. And of course I did find it. And she said, how did you know that he was telling me the truth? And I said, because he had Hemingway eyes. Well, she broke up in hysterics. <laughs> she, she was a real person. It's just that she was bigger than life. Yeah. Yeah, because she really was. She's just one of those people, you know. And then you've got the other side of the coin. You've got Angela Lansbury, who, uh, you know, like we say, like, you know, you think of Carol Chan, it's like, oh, that kind of like ditzy, whatever, you know, thing she played. Angela Lansbury is the complete opposite. Angela Lansbury, like, exuded, like, you know, brains and, you know, like all of this. Uh, what would for, and, and I've had quite a few people on that, you know, knew her and there's nothing that's ever been said bad. But I'm curious, what was your take on Angela Lansbury? Well, Angela was so glamorous. Mm -hmm. And and I think that was sort of the difference. And also she was British, Irish. I mean, it was a, it, just a totally different vibe. But yeah. your, but your um, audience members may not know that Angela was not the first choice. Actually, we need to go back for one quick second. Carol Channing was not the first choice for Hello, Dolly. She was the fourth. Who, 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 wait, wait, wait. So who are the other three? Okay, so Jerry wrote Hello, Dolly with Ethel Merman's voice in the back of his head. It's, it's and totally. she was exhausted and she said, no. She said, I just, I don't want to do that. Then they took it to Nanette Fabre and she said, no. And then I think she was a little put off that she had to audition. And then oh, there was, and then there was Mary Martin but she was it, she was contracted to do another show, which ironically closed three days after it opened, and it killed her. Oh my she, gosh! And then they offered it to Carol Channing. So you talk about you know destiny first working exactly. So the same thing was kind of true with Angela Lansbury, except Jerry really wanted Angela. He knew that she was the right name. Mm -hmm. And she had just come off of the Manchurian Candidate, where she played a, uh, a character. She played the, the mom, wasn't it? Or, or... Exactly. Yeah. And she was 
dowdy and evil and just the, there was that ick factor to her character yeah. so nobody could see her playing Maine. jerry knew so he taught her two songs if he walked into my life and it's today and when it was her turn to audition he left the producer and director and writers in the audience to see and he snuck in the pit and he played her audition oh my gosh well, the rest, as they say, is history. And honestly, I cannot imagine anyone other than Angela Lansbury playing Mame. She was the woman at the right time to yep. play that. I would agree and, 100%. And she, you know, Mame is 40 through most of the show. Yeah. And last two scenes, she's, you know, she's older. And it's always so hard because really older women want to play name and you have to stop and say no it's not an old person's you know middle age or old person's right you know, role. it's a young vibrant sexy woman she was right. anyway so so that was kind of fun and then Angela went on to do um Dear World and that won her her second Tony and so I think Jerry's just done the most amazing job of having the best talent for his shows I mean, you think about Mac and Mabel, which may not be as widely known, but that mm -hmm. show has a cult following. Um, I can't think of a more perfect Mabel Norman than Bernadette Peters at the time. Oh, Everything God. about her, from her size to her, you know, adorable manner. I mean, she was Mabel Norman. So it's just, it's a lot of fun. Did he kind of, uh, I mean, I'm not saying discover her, but did he kind of launch her a bit in essence? To a certain degree, I think she had done um, what was it, Damn Yankees? But I think, she, yeah, okay. yeah. But I, but I think I think uh, Mac and Mabel really put her on on the map. I gotcha. You know, another thing that I read about Jerry that um, it was honestly it was sad because this is and it's a, it's I don't want to say it's a common story, but it's a story I certainly have heard before. Is his mom actually only saw like one of his very first productions and that was literally after like school you know like after the university and she passed it, she was young she was like 48 no she was younger she was no. like she was like 41 42 she oh, died of jaw, she died of jaw cancer actually jerry was jerry was in it was literally right after college jerry must have been about 22 years old when when ruth passed away and I always feel that Jerry felt I was sort of the angel that came in for his mom because she and I had the same birthday. Wow. And she was the inspiration for so many of his songs. So the song, for example, It's Today from Maine, that was a line right out of Ruth's mouth. I mean, they were famous for having their, their dress up cocktail parties when he was a kid and she'll and he, he would come and say mom why are you dressed in that costume and she said jerry it's today oh wow it, so you know and that's why going back to what i said earlier it's so important for people to actually live and to be with real people because so much of that dialogue or those lyrics come out of your experience with real people. My mother was Southern. She was from North Carolina. Mm -hmm. So in the, in the score name, um, talking about pecan pies, yeah. that was my mother. She was famous for her pecan pies. So there's, you find a little oh. bit of, you know, you find all these people in, in his lyrics. I love that he brought, you know, I, I was going to ask you, I mean, that's kind of, I, I brought that in there because I, I was wondering because to have a parent and, and I, I got the, I mean, I researched him quite a bit and to get the a parent that obviously she wasn't a distant parent, she was a, a strength in his life to lose someone like that when you're at age 22, 20, you know, um, devastating. Devastating, devastating, literally devastating. And so it's, it, I, I just thought, and then he goes on and he writes about all these strong women. And I thought, I mean, it has to be in there. I mean, come on, you know? Yes, I, I would, I would say so. And it's a lot of people have commented on how well he understood women. It was mm -hmm. as though he could get into the soul. It was like an x-ray 
of someone's soul. And if he walked into my life, is there a parent, especially a mother who has that moment where they say, if you could do it all over again, would you have made the same choices? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, I know. <laughs> you know it, it grabs it, it grabs at your heart today. Or how about um, I won't send roses from Mac and Mabel? How do you write a love song for an anti-hero for someone that has no love in his heart, but sort of does? The best he can do is say, I love you, so I'm telling you to stay away, kid. I mean, how Jerry could come up with the understanding these concepts was brilliant. And I think his lyrics are something that is going to be rediscovered over time because mm -hmm. they're, they're utterly fantastic. No, they are. They are. I There was, um, oh, a couple of things. One, when you were you're talking about Mame, it went through my head. Am I right on this that he wrote it like I want to say in a weekend or something. I mean, it's yes. like ridiculously short window. So Jerry wrote incredibly fast. I remember he wrote, I would say 80% of the score of Mac and Mabel from a flight from New York to Los Angeles. Unbelievable. Um, and, you know, I, I asked him, I said, do you write the music first or the lyrics first? And he looked at me like I had three heads. And he said, it's at the same time. He said, they're connected. And I'm thinking, oh, wow. like, okay, <laughs> sure. Yeah. Just anybody. Wow. He literally did that, that in that short window. Yeah. How long, yeah. what was MAME? Do you know how long that took? Was that? Uh... That was, that was practically a weekend. Um, so <laughs> I think there's, there's a wonderful story. Jerry had just finished writing Milk and Honey. And for your audience members yeah. who are familiar with that score, I say run out and listen to it. The music is so lush, you can't believe it. I mean, let's not waste a moment. Um, literally, it just brings tears to your eyes because the music is so rich and melodic yeah. and everything. Yeah. So Jerry had just gotten all of these accolades for Milk and Honey. And David Merrick saw the show and he was very impressed, but Milk and Honey was about this new state called Israel. Mm -hmm. And he said to Jerry, he said, look, I think you're very talented, but can you write an American musical? And he said, Mr. Merrick, there's no one more American in apple pie than me. So Jerry got a hold of the underlying material mm -hmm. and he goes to David Merrick's office three days later with four songs and he plays them for David Merrick. For This is for Hello, Dolly. I mean, David Merrick, a legend. In, th in theater. A, yeah. a legend. Yeah. And, and also notoriously tough too. Mm -hmm. And he listened to the fourth song and he said, kid, the show is yours. Wow. Wow. So I mean, that is just how fast Jerry wrote. Yeah, that's crazy. I mean, really, you know, you, you hear about people like that. I've, you know, I remember years ago, I mean, it's totally unre unrelated as far as like musical theater, but I remember seeing something with like Lionel Richie and he was explaining, he's like, it just, it, it like comes it like comes into their heads and it just, it's almost like a conduit and you just have to let it go. You know, well, I have a CD of Jerry talking about how he wrote the song. I am what I am. Oh, I know and, a song. Yeah, yeah. You know, that beautiful, song. beautiful song. I think it didn't, didn't Leslie Uggams actually sing that. Uh, she at, was it at the Memorial or uh, she did. And yeah. she brought down the house. I mean, we're still talking about it. It was that fantastic. And Gloria Gaynor recorded it, the disco version. And I think oh, it yeah. was a gold, a, a gold album. Um, but I heard the, the interview with Jerry saying he was in a meeting with Arthur Lawrence and with um, Harvey Firestein. Oh, sure. And so they were getting towards the end of act one and Harvey wrote the scene, the, you know, basically the scene where um, Alba a.k.a. Zaza, um, is told that he can't come to his son's wedding because he's too gay, he's too effeminate or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so Harvey wrote something to the effect, well, I am what I am. And Jerry stopped the meeting and he said to Harvey, if I can have those five words, he said, I will write you a song to end act one like you can't believe. So they all wow. left. 
he called them all back at 10 o'clock the next morning. And he had the song, I am what I am. And I mean, they were beside themselves. That's amazing. That really is. Cause that is, that's just a beautiful song. Um, what, uh, um, what do you know about the uh, background with, you know, yes, Hello Dolly's huge and it's, it's still huge, but Louis Armstrong had the song actually out, I believe, before they actually opened the production. Greatest story ever. Yeah, let's so, hear it, because I'd like okay. to know how that came about. Okay, so back in the day, do you remember 45s? Oh, of course, yeah. yeah I'm, I'm not, I, luckily, I, I, am, I am able to, hear, to understand that, yes. Okay, great. So for those people who don't know it, 45 was when big recording artists would record a very popular song on side A, and side B was a throwaway song. Mm -hmm. So they were in the studio and one of the guys said, here, record this. They literally threw in the music. It's this new song that, that, that I just got. Oh. And so he says, what is it? And they say, it's called Hello Dolly. Louis had never seen it. He completely improvised the whole song in the studio. Oh. This song was so popular that it knocked the Beatles off the charts. And I want to hold your hand. I, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so everyone knew this Hello, the Louis Armstrong version of Hello, Dolly. And it further, you know, made people want to go see the show. But the other thing people don't realize is Hello, Dolly was the first happy musical after the Kennedy assassination. Mm -hmm. And this country needed to heal. They, we needed to laugh again. Mm -hmm. And the show... Hello Dolly at its core is about second chances. And this is so perfectly mirrored, this country's need for a second chance. And I just think that all of the elements, Hello Dolly is a perfect show. They had an nice. amazing, it, it's just a perfect show yeah. on every level. It is seamless. And the talent, the music and lyrics, the orchestrations, the costumes, everything about that show, plus the timing, plus the Louis Armstrong uh, mm -hmm. recording. I mean, it was all, all of the pieces fell into place. Oh yeah. Without that, you know, I find, I found it kind of ironic by the way, too, that when he receives the Kennedy center honor part of the, you know, they always do it to like three, uh, four people, something like that. One of the, one of the four was Paul McCartney. <laughs> so yes, that's not only did he kick him off the they, number one, but then exactly. they both got the Kennedy center honor at the same time. And they were, and they were good friends. And also, you know, as you go through, you wonder who musically the, the friends are, you know, who the family friends are, yeah. but Jerry adored Elton John, adored oh. him. I mean, so there are all of these wonderful creative geniuses and talents, and they all had such love and respect for one another. It was, it was truly lovely. So he, he did, and he also, he did know Paul, huh? He knew Paul McCartney. Yes, well. yes, yes. I'll be darned. That, that's wonderful. But, you know, I, I kind of get, you know, when, I mean, I put all of I, everyone you just mentioned, I put on a genius level. I mean, Jerry starting out with it. And and it's cool that they they find that in each other, you know, that that uh, that common ground. You know, it's not just about genre, you know. Yeah. There was one other element. Jerry was a gentleman. He was one of the kindest people you would ever meet. You don't hear I've never heard anyone say a cross word no. about him. he was just he was just he was happy he was joyful the best sense of humor you could possibly imagine and he could make anything beautiful you know oh. if he saw something that he didn't like he would take out some paint and paint it and make it beautiful I mean you know, it was that that's just who he was. That's pretty cool. Is there, you know, I, I mean this literally, is there ever a time that there hasn't been like a Jerry Herman production happening somewhere in the world? I mean, I I'm thinking like right it's, now. I mean, they, they must be happening as we're literally, speaking. literally all over the world in so many different languages. And that's pretty wonderful, you know, because his music brings joy. And I also think too what he writes about, the underlying material that he chooses, they're just ubiquitous themes. Everyone can relate to them. Yeah. And I think that not only was he talented in what he wrote, he was also very talented in the properties that he chose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Agreed. Agreed. Is um the by the way, you know, you mentioned the memorabilia sale. Are you allowed to, you know, give a, you know, a hint at a few items that might be? Of course. There? Okay. The biggest spoiler alert: his piano is being auctioned off. Oh wow! Wow. Is it yeah, a that, Steinway that, by chance? It's a Yamaha. Yamaha. Okay. All right. So I know it had to be one of the two. You know. Exactly. So I think that's pretty special. That is. His, his Kennedy Center Award. Wow. Will be will be auctioned off. Um, oh my gosh. Uh, there's a Hirschfeld with all of the uh, stars on that that have signed oh, it. Oh man! Him. Um, he's got. Uh, sh let's see. I'm just trying to think. His sure. uh, Hollywood Walk of Fame um, star is 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 framed. Uh, there's something that I think is so cool. It's not big like that. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. There's there's a piano key, and Jerry has signed it, and it's in Lucite. And I just adore that. There are a ton That's of awards cool. that is very, it, I, I think just visually, it's really cool. Um, and he also had a very distinctive signature as well. Oh my gosh, again, so many awards, he, the show jackets, um, uh, photographs of stars. There are a couple of great letters, one from Angela, one from um, Carol Channing. Oh, those are, those it, are really valuable. There's just so much. If you go to the website, um, www.doyle.com, I believe the the memorabilia is already up there now. And oh, it is up. Okay. I, I believe so. So you'll have a good time going through everything. How long is the auction on for the crypt, by the way? You said it, it, go, it just went up. How long will that be open? Um, so I believe the website goes up today and it is, um, uh, I believe it's a one- there, there's a it's a one day what I don't know what the exact time is yet but on oh, it's a no pretty tight window it's a very it's a tight window and uh, studio auctions does a beautiful job I believe um Marlon Brando's um tuxedo that he uh, wore in the Godfather will also be wow. auctioned off at the same time so studio auctions they don't do a gazillion things they just have a, a tight curated group of things and they're all very very special they're big money items. I mean, they're let's be honest. Yeah. And, and, and also they're truly of interest. They're truly one of a kind mm -hmm. items. So. Uh, I got you. What is your, uh, you know, as I said early on, you are the manager of the Jerry Herman estate. Uh, what is your goal now? I mean, um, you know, and I guess until you pass yourself, what is your goal with this estate? What is it that you okay, hope so to So first thing is I made Jerry a promise that his music would never be forgotten. So that is number one, you know, mm -hmm. it start and everything else. Um, I would also like to make his music more accessible to a whole new younger generation. I'm hoping that we will see films of his work. Um, he has a an unproduced show called Miss Spectacular. Oh, wow. And there's a concept album that was done. The music is so much fun and so quintessential Jerry Herman. And I'm hoping to get that produced shortly in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. um, there is obviously continuing the shows all over the world. And then also for your viewers who are, or audience members who are not familiar with Dear World, um, mm -hmm. It's loosely based on the Mad Woman of Shio, and oh. it's so timely because it talks, amongst other things, about environmental issues, and there's such a message in that, mm -hmm. and I would love to do that, um, actually, an animated feature, because I think it really lends itself to that kind of a, of a presentation. So Mac and Mabel is due for a revival. Um, it's... If pressed, he would probably say it was his favorite score, although yeah. it's kind of hard because you know your score. Oh, it's so vast. Ex exactly. Yeah. yeah. Love, love to get that one up and running again. Um, I think uh, I don't know if it's been announced yet, but hopefully we. Oh, most importantly, um, uh, Mrs. Santa Claus. Mrs. Santa Claus was done on CBS with Angela Lansbury. Yeah. And we we're going to turn it into a, a, a show. So we're going to get it up on its legs at good speed. 
And I am very excited. And we found some songs that were cut from the show that we look forward to putting back into into the into the stage version. So wow. there's a there's a lot of great stuff that's that's going on. But as I said, I would love to have some younger, more contemporary artists record his songs so that a whole new generation can can fall in love with it all over again. I gotcha. Two two other questions I got for you. One is obviously, you know, hello Dolly, you know, well, Mame, I mean, I'm trying to think all of them pretty much, they they went on to become movies. Um, what- uh, Only how, two. Well, two. Well, I guess Mame and uh, Hello Dolly, right? Those, yeah. are, the, those are the two. What, uh, how involved was Jerry in the, in that side of it? Not really. And I think, not really. I think, you know, the structure, what, on Broadway, he's king. And in the movies, there's a totally different structure where, of course, he gets to have some say in terms of orchestrations and music and casting mm -hmm. things like that. But it didn't have his thumbprint on it the way, you know, a show would. Um, it was interesting if you take Hello, Dolly. Initially, he thought Streisand was too young hmm. to play the part. And over time, he really came to appreciate her performance in that. You know, wow, she she really did pull that off. Maine was interesting because as physically correct as Lucille Ball was, she didn't have the vocal chops to pull it off. Right. And, and that was, I think, always, always a challenge. So um, I'm hoping that we'll see many, many more. I mean, I think Mac and Mabel is right to to do as a as a movie and i think of course lacage we're all dying for that yeah yeah you know, to be honest so, with you, i'm surprised that it yeah has it <laughs> well 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 i'm sure at some point in time it will happen and when it does it will be a huge huge extravagance oh yeah now my last question for you is you you know i mean people listening to this it's like oh that's fantastic she's manager of that and it is but what people don't realize is you also have your own career. You have you are a realtor. You have all all this going on. I mean this in the best way, but how the heck are you able to do what we've just talked about and have a career? You know, I am blessed with incredible energy. And believe it or not, the same skill set for organization and, you know, a real estate transaction is kind of like a mini production, but it just has a much shorter lifespan. So I'm I'm with Carolwood. I have our, my own little team called the advisory at Carolwood. And we we are blessed to be able to uh, sell some of the prettiest, most consequential real estate in the greater Los Angeles area. And it's a it's just a lot of fun. So the answer is if you want something done, ask a busy person. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing is, is you literally must start from that morning, you know, cup of coffee. I do. I'm up, at five I'm up at five o'clock and go to bed at midnight. So like you said, somewhere in the world, there's a Jerry Herman musical playing. Well, somewhere in the world, I need to talk to somebody. And it just it's it's such a shot in the arm. But honestly, um, I am so honored to be able to make sure that Jerry's music is heard and presented in a way that he would want it to be. And uh, that is something that uh, it, it doesn't erase the pain of losing him, but it allows me to stay connected to him in a very special sort of a way. I like what you just said. You know, it's interesting. It's not just that you're overseeing the, um, the estate and, and the property, so to speak, but you're overseeing them that they're done correctly. Yeah, that's to the best of your ability. I mean, things happen, but but that's a biggie. That really is. That's a biggie over like, you know, quote unquote, a corporation is taking it over or whatever. This sounds, you know, no one, you know, people would look at this and they would go, well, my gosh, you should you know, be making a lot of money from this and all this and that and all that. No one would take on the job you're talking about if you did not have a, a true love for the man, you know? Oh, he... How can I say it? he was my family? I mean, if you look at Lacage, mm -hmm. that's sort of us. I mean, there really wasn't, I mean, everyone says, so how does a Jewish girl get, you know, get a godfather? And I just said, we defined our own family. We made our own family. And literally, if I needed help with my homework, Jerry was there for me. You know, when I was at Cedar Sinai having, you know, delivering my baby, 
Jerry was there because he had an infected finger. The synergy between the two of us is just, you know, when he had open heart surgery, I got to the hospital at four o'clock in the morning because I didn't want him to wake up scared before he had to go into surgery. We were just connected in a way. I mean, everybody thinks of Jerry as this extraordinarily talented man. And yes, of course he was, but he was also a human being. And it's mm -hmm. it's that love that we had for one another. You know, that's that's unique. That That's something that I think only I, I have. I mean, everybody else can have another piece of him, but that familial growing up with him, being partially raised by him, that's unique to us. Yeah, and his... He's he's buried between his own mother and your mom. I mean, come on. It says, says it, all. it all. Exactly. So yeah. his, his his two best girls. And I like to think of myself as one of his best girls as well. And uh, I'm just here to to make sure that we all s celebrate him and his music. And and we will. Oh, yeah. Without a doubt. I, I don't doubt that for a minute with you. Um, well, listen, Jane, thank you so much for uh, being on That's Classic. I, I really enjoyed talking with you and I, I give you a lot of credit. I, I, I think that's awesome that you're carrying on the legacy of Jerry Herman in this way. So it is so my pleasure. And thank you for having me on. You got it. Total, total pleasure. I, I wish you the best with all the success with all the auction and everything. Thank you so much. You got it. All right. I'll see you. Bye bye. Bye. Well, thanks for listening and definitely hit the subscription button as well. Hit the notification bell so that you'll know when my next episode is released. In addition, check out some of my other interviews. If you haven't had a chance, Eric Roberts, Henry Winkler, Jerry Mathers from Leave it to Beaver. There's so many. Enjoy.